Hi, I'm Jim Cunningham and welcome to Giving the Gift of Education. I have Christina Lindsay Orta as a guest from Ascent Wealth Management. And today we're gonna to cover the pitfalls and advantages of structuring a gift to educate loved ones. And, and this is a disclaimer, Christina is a certified financial planner. I'm, I'm an attorney. This is information only. It's not legal advice. It's not financial advice. Please don't take it as such. So Christina, you know, I know you and I value education. We, um, we are kind of lifelong learners and we value education. I know your, your parents and your family and they value education and mine does too. And probably the people who are watching this understand the benefits of education. It's a great equalizer in our society. So, um, you know, it, it, it matters what your background is, but when it comes to education, this is uh, the land of opportunity in the United States. And for many, many people, they do take the opportunity to get an education, to elevate themselves um, and, and their families, quite frankly, and people live a happier, longer, healthy, healthier life with, with education. And we do live in a democracy where people vote and an educated, um, <laughs> educated citizens are better than uneducated citizens. So there are a lot of benefits and, you know, before we get into this, I do want to stress the government really does, there, there's a big federal push to promote education. You know, there's a department of education and, you know, depending on Reagan wanted to get rid of it, right? I'm not talking about the politics of it. I'm just saying that there is a stated federal, um, it's really important to the federal government, uh, it pays about eight and a half percent of K through 12 education that comes, comes from the federal government, uh, transfers to, you know, if you want to pay your kids tuition at NYU and it's 80 grand, uh, it, that's not a gift, right? If you pay it directly to the institution. So there are a lot of favorable tax treatments for educational institutions. And that includes the public, the, the private and the for-profit um, institutions. They all receive a level of governmental support. So with that teed up, the importance of education, Christina, and the government, the federal government being very much behind education why don't you walk us through some ways that that loved ones can fund um, a, a, another loved one's in, inherit or uh, education? Yeah. So uh, thanks, Jim. And uh, education is is incredibly important. Um, and a, a, a quick tidbit: uh, Jim and I got to uh, meet each other uh, many, many, many years ago. And uh, unfortunately, the the day I turned eighteen, uh, my uncle decided to sue me for my education fund and Jim had to represent me the day I turned 18. My grandparents did not want to leave any inheritance whatsoever to the grandchildren, but they wanted us. It was so critically important to have education. So they left us a college trust fund to pay for all of a, the grandkids education. So that was one thing that was just ingrained from the get go, uh, is, is education. And, um, and that's also why you want to have an, a very properly structured estate plan so that you don't have those challenges to uh, those gifts of education legacies. So you definitely want to make sure that you've got a properly uh, documented estate plan. But education is one of those things that um, can be funded in a variety of ways. So the, as Jim mentioned, giving directly to an institution. So if you're paying any payments for a child, grandchild, um, niece, nephew, trying to do some sort of gifting to get money out of your estate. There's no annual gifting limit to pay funds directly to an institution. So um, now if you're paying you know, a gift to a grandchild to then go pay uh, for their car payment or room and board and, and then spend money, then it's, then it's going to be subject to the annual gift exclusion. But if you're paying a gift of education and making that payment directly to the institution or university, then it is um, not subject to gift limitations. Uh, so there, we're gonna talk about a couple of different ways of uh, funding, gifting for education, five to nine plans, Roth IRAs, and life insurance are the most common. So we'll spend a few moments on the five to nine plan because that's one of the things that uh, um, is, more, is more common, I would say. Um, but before we get to the five to nine plan, what, this, what we do wanna highlight, I think this is kind of known, but um, it doesn't hurt to see a visual of what college costs are today and what the expectation is with the growth rate of inflation on the cost of education. So, um, you know, it's not very um, out of the norm to go, okay, private university costs 50 grand a year today. That's probably, you know, 40, 50 grand. People kind of expect that. They know that. Um, and that doesn't really include room, board, books, laptops, 
um, you know, Uber payments for your, for your kid. So this is just the cost of the education tuition. Hmm. You know, Christina, I got to tell you something. I'm looking at these numbers and I'm reminded when I was, uh, let's see, we had our son when I was 27. And I think when I was 28, I sat down with the person who was handling our finances at that time. And I said, yeah, I think we need to do one of these, you know, we need to save for college. And he says, well, you know what college is going to cost it's going to cost, you know, $200,000 for four years. And I thought to myself, no, no way. way. <laughs> no way. So if you see this number of 491,000 or 766,000 or 363,000, this is not, these aren't guesses, mm -mm. but uh, what's happening is the cost of, of education is outpacing inflation every year. It so is. these, these are, these are significantly higher um, mm -hmm. even on an inflation adjusted dollars, right? These are significantly higher um, than, than what a university costs today. Correct. Yeah. The, um, you know, inflation's at 6.2%, which is astronomical right now, just for, you know, consumer price inflation index. And the university, four-year university uh, inflation has been running between six and 8% for the last couple of decades. So, um, we're seeing inflation in every aspect of our lives these days, but the education inflation has been around for quite some time in the six to 8%. So when we look at these numbers, um, you know, it wasn't all that long ago that, you know, I went to a private university and, um, a couple decades ago and it was 25 grand a year and that's already doubled. So I'm looking at these numbers today of 2022 and, um, you got two kids, strong. Christina. You got two kids. I got so two you're, kids. You're, you're so I'm, dream, right? I have I have opened my um, various forms of college funding. Uh, I've done a couple of variety of these strategies that we're going to talk about today. So you can't, you don't have to do just one. The nice thing is you can do a combination, which uh, we're going to get into the details. But this is just a reminder of why it's important to start early. So oftentimes, when our clients have a, a new grandchild. We talk to them about opening a five to nine because the sooner you start, the the better. It's just um, you know that eighth wonder of the world, compound interest. And if you can get compound interest tax free, um, it's going to make a huge impact on making a dent in that uh, cost of education. So, um, giving directly to a student is always an option. Uh, the annual gift exclusion limit is actually going up to sixteen thousand dollars next year. Hey. So um, that's going to be um, per donor per donee. So if you have a married couple, they can give $30,000 per year to each student. So if you've got, um, you know, two children, you can have $60,000 as a married couple be gifted to um, children or grandchildren and give them as a gift without having to file a gift tax return. You know, another alternative to gifting directly to a student mm -hmm. And this is if you're a business owner. So if you're a business owner, and typically it's going to be the sole shareholder, many of our clients will put their children on payroll and have them do something, you know, whatever it is. So you pay your kid 30 grand a year and maybe use their likeness and marketing materials. Uh, maybe they help stuff envelopes. They do, you know, whatever it is they're doing. And uh, they pay tax, income tax on that money, but they're also paying it at their lower rate. And the other thing it does when you put, when you add a child, uh, and typically these are kind of college age children, when you add a child on, that gives them income and that helps build their credit. So when they go out to get their first apartment or they go out, you know, after school, they've got a track record when it comes to credit, because um, I will tell you to do any, to rent any apartment now uh, or any house, most people are going to run a credit check. And so right. if you don't have credit, if you have bad credit or no credit, it's going to be really hard to get your life started. So I would say if you're a business owner, this is certainly something that, you know, Christine and I can talk to you about. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, but it's something to think about. It's not just a gift, but sometimes it's it's actually paying somebody, and then they pay income tax on that money. Absolutely. So there's a, there's certainly more options to think consider as a business owner. So, um, so again, you can do some gifting directly to the student, and that can be used to cover room and board, books, etc. So if you're paying directly to the institution, you're not subject to that gift limit. If you're paying um, it directly to the individual, it can be used to cover non-tuition items, but subject to the gift limitations. So, um, yeah, so, so best practices, I would say, Christina, is if your kids go into, you know, NYU, let's say, uh, pay the tuition directly to the university. Yep. Right. Uh, that's just kind of basic, um, 
hygiene when it comes to finance in college, or if maybe you're, if your parents are paying for your kids' uh, mm -hmm. college, have them make the payment directly to the institution. Exactly. And so I think we've, we've covered that, but it is unlimited for gift and GST tax purposes, generation skipping tax purposes as well. Um, and it doesn't impact financial aid qualification by making direct payments to the institution. So if you're a parent and uh, making that direct payment or a grandparent making that direct payment to the university or institution, um, it does not impact financial aid. So that's also an, another important um, qualifier. So let's kind of get into five to nine plans. Five to nine plans are one of the greatest uh, things that came around for tax-free growth and tax-free distributions. And so the nice thing with a five to nine plan, um, you know, we're, we're not talking about some other things that exist today on this, what for purposes of this webinar, because they're so underutilized, you know, the Coverdell and some of those types of things and Pell Grants, and there are different types of government programs out there, but truly they're just, there's such low um, income limitations. They're not highly utilized. And so um, the nice thing though, with a five to nine plan is there is no income limitation to fund a five to nine plan. So it, you know, where there's um, Roth IRA income limitations. If you make too much money, you can't contribute to a Roth IRA. There is no income limitations to contribute to a five to nine plan. Um, you do have some limited investment options. You're typically limited to certain mutual funds. Um, that doesn't mean that you're limited to, um, you know, just, you know, plain vanilla. You can actually get some really high quality um, mutual funds in a 529 plan. So it, you can't go buy individual shares of Microsoft or Apple, but you can buy very high quality five-star Morningstar uh, mutual funds. Um, the 529 plan does have an annual contribution limit per donor, per donee. So you, you know, if you have a five to nine plan for one grandchild and you have another five to nine plan for another grandchild as a married couple, you can do $30,000 per grandchild in any given year as a contribution to a five to nine plan. Again, that's going to go up to 16,000 next year in 2022. One of the things that's existed for uh, five to nine plans for some time is that you can front load your annual exemptions. You can front load five years or currently 75,000 per donor per donee without having to file a gift tax return. So this is not taxable um, and you can, you can front load. So if you've got the ability to do that and you're looking at a high uh, estate, I know we're all looking at in 2026, the estate tax limits come down. I know that we were expecting that that could could still be potentially, although it's very unlikely. Who knows? Just, Who knows? At this point, uh, the, it looks like as of Sunday evening, the um, estate tax exemptions got thrown out of the current bill. But um, you know, in 2026, regardless, the estate tax limits are set to sunset and revert back to the old limitations. So if you if you've got a high estate and you're looking to get some money out of the estate and give that gift of education, doing a five year annual gift exclusion is a great way to do it. Yeah, yeah. So just just unpacking that a little bit. So that's called super funding of a, 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 um, a five twenty nine. And so right. what each grandparent can it does require a, a gift tax return. I think what you meant, Christina, is there's no it doesn't erode your unified. I'm sorry, it does not use your lifetime gifting yeah, exemption. exemption. It does require a, a yeah. gift tax return. So here's you know, uh, grandma and grandpa. If you got little Johnny who's three years old, uh, if grandma and grandpa put one hundred fifty thousand into a five twenty nine, which they can do without eroding any death tax exemption, mm -hmm. that will fund three out of four years for a three-year-old at a, at a public university. If you kind of do the math and-, and It'll probably fund it fully if you do it at three because- of Yeah, the well, rate. it depends on your rate of return. I, I, I was a little conservative. I had about a six and a half percent rate of return. Yeah. But mm -hmm. my point is, if you have three grandkids, you can do this for three grandkids, 150,000 each. Perfect. And you might think, well, I don't want to give up 450,000, but look, let's face it. If, if you're thinking about funding a grandchild's education, you're probably not going to run out of money. And it's a great way, you know, if you, certainly if you have a taxable estate and what Christina, what Christina is talking about is it's either going to be January 1 uh, of next year, which right now is just a couple months from now, or it's going to be January 1 of 2026 or sometime in between. But death taxes are going up. Mm -hmm. It's a fact. That's what the law says. Now the law could change and that could accelerate. But it's something to understand is if you have a taxable estate, you know, if you have a 20 or $30 million estate 
and you can gift 450,000 to three grandkids, that's cutting your tax bill, your death tax bill by a couple hundred thousand dollars that does not even include the future growth. So if you're thinking about multi-generational wealth, and if you're watching our webinars, Christine and I have been on a lot of these webinars, we are really focused on building intergenerational wealth. This is a fantastic strategy to use. Yes. And if you're not thinking about it, I would really encourage you um, to think about it, right? Because this is, this is a big one. And I would say, Christina, of sort of the top three estate planning devices of, in terms of high value, I kind of put this in the top three. Um, it, it's just tremendous, tremendous value. Mm -hmm. So we do have some questions. Uh, yep. We have, uh, it's uh, Nate says, I think many would argue it's not quite accurate to say there's an income limit on a Roth IRA, at least currently. Well, th there is to make a contribution right. to a Roth, right? There's a, an income cap. If you're over, is it 160 individual or married yes. or something like that? Yep. You, you're limited on what you can contribute to a Roth IRA based on your adjusted gross income. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, uh, but that's not a Roth conversion, which is not a, a Roth conversion. A that's Roth a backdoor funding of a Roth. Yes. Yeah. Right. Anonymous asks, what are the limits when you're paying the student loan? Can anyone pay? Thank you. What about paying a student loan? It's a great question. Currently, there's been some discussion about changing that, but currently that is subject to the gift exemption and your lifetime gifting exemption. So it's either your annual gift um, exclusion or your lifetime gifting uh, exemption. If you pay the student loan, that's considered a gift. So that's again, where if you have the opportunity prior to uh, incurring a student loan, it would be better to pay the institution directly. Yeah, and if you're in that situation, anonymous, where you you know maybe a, a grandkid has run up a two hundred thousand dollars student loan debt, which is actually very common for professionals. These mm -hmm. would be lawyers, doctors, um, dentists, other other professionals with advanced degrees. If you want to pay that two hundred thousand dollars off, you can. It could be structured as a loan, and this is another way of doing it. So it's also something called a self canceling installment note, where you say, "I will lend you two hundred thousand dollars." and I will forgive 15,000 a year. So it's a way where you actually can pay it off and then given enough time, you can use that $15,000 or next year, the $16,000 exemption to reduce uh, or, or to not erode your, your death tax exemption. So that's something that we could certainly help you out with if you did wanna pay a very large uh, student loan amount. But I will say, you know, there was been, in a lot of, uh, been a lot of news coverage of people who are stuck with student loan debt. And, Student loan debt, uh, the, the people that it injures the most are not the people who actually get a degree and they have 200,000 in, in student loan debt. It's the person who started school, kind of dropped out, out, of, out, of, out in the first semester and has a $15,000 student loan debt. Those are the people who are really kind of penalized the most, quite frankly. And because one of the things I will mention under, um, this was um, part of the... Uh, uh, tax Cuts and Jobs Act was the ability for an employer match. So let's just say if you go right out of college and you're working for an employer that offers a 401k, that employer, rather than matching your contribution uh, to the 401k, if they do any kind of match program, you can ask for that match to be paid directly to the student loan as opposed to a deposit into your 401k retirement account. So that's another area that's it's new. It's fairly overlooked that um, you can have the employer still gets the write off because they're helping um, contribute towards your student loan payments. But that's something if you're young and you're, um, it's always good to contribute to a 401k, but you're not as concerned about retirement funding quite yet, get the student loan match as opposed to the retirement match. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's just another example of how the government favors education. The government favors this education industrial complex. I know it's kind of trite to say it put everything some industrial complex, but uh, th this is a big, uh, a big engine in, you know, economic engine in the United States. Let me ask you, Christina, let me ask you about that. So how would you advise a young professional, maybe someone who's out of law school, they're maybe 28, 30 years old, should they be paying down should they be using this contribute that match to go into their 401k or should that be paid down on the student loan? What, what do you think is, is best? I know it's case by case, but on a high level, what, what would you suggest? Case by case, but it's certainly case by case on a high level. If they're under 30, I would take the, the student loan payment as opposed to the retirement plan. Mm. Okay. All right. Um, so kind of going over a couple myths of five to nines, I know that there's a lot of uh, just confusing information out there. There's a lot of different types of five to nines. Um, one of the myths is that it can only be used for a four-year school, which is not true. Um, five to nines can be used in any state. 
certain states offer some state incentives, um, but by and large, you can just, we typically would recommend a client to use a, a five to nine plan that's domiciled um, in, in states that don't have you can, any favorability. You can take the funds and use at any of the states for any uh, institution. Five to nine plans can be used for junior community college and graduate school. It can be used for room and board, books, laptops, supplies, utilities for room and board, anything associated with that student's cost of attending a accredited school. It can be used for vocational schools, trade schools. So there's constant conversation about how there's a lack of people in the trade business. So when we talk about education, this does not need to be a four-year university. It can be postgraduate. It can also be trade school, vocational school. Um, so those are some of the things that are often, often overlooked. It also does not have an age limitation. So if you've got um, a, an adult that's raised children and now wants to go back and get an additional degree. I mean, you can use a five to nine plan to um, go get additional education at any stage of life. And the other thing that's a common uh, myth is that if you, they don't use all the funds, well, what if my kid gets a scholarship? What if my, you know, what if I've got too much money in the five to nine plan and they can't use it all? So there's a couple options there. One, um, it's easily, easily transferable to another underlying beneficiary. So if you've got a niece, a nephew, a, a cousin, another child, a grandchild, you can transfer the unused portion to any other student. Um, the other thing too, is if you have a student that gets a, a scholarship, you can actually take out at the end of their graduation, you can take out what their scholarship was tax-free from the five to nine plan. So if they have a hundred thousand dollars scholarship and a hundred thousand dollars in the five to nine plan, they don't need the five to nine for any extras because their scholarship covered it. They can take that out equivalent without any penalty if they got a scholarship. Wow. That, you know, and I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm seeing a broader, if you use the vehicle of a 529, and you're going to be paying a tuition. This seems like a superior vehicle than just writing a check because you're going to have a, a gift tax consequence on the room and board books and supplies. And Right. Um, so those. if you, for example, let's just say hypothetical, you've got a student that has a $50,000 five to nine plan, their cost of education is going to cost significantly more. Pay direct payments to the institution if you can afford it. Pay the direct payments to the institution because there's no gift tax issue and use the five to nine plan to fund room and board and other things that would otherwise require a gift tax return. Great. So we have a couple of questions. Lee asks, if I transfer existing stock to the 529 uh, plan, will the actual stock sale be treated as income and taxed? So how yeah. do you fund a 529? You have to fund a 529 plan with cash. You cannot do it with in-kind, unfortunately. Now, if you do have stock, there's some other variations. You can use a trust structure. There's also something called a health and education trust, also known as a heat trust. And yep. we're not covering those uh, super in depth today, but that there are other strategies you could use if you have a, a, an asset that has capital appreciation. Many times you can have the recipient pay those taxes at their lower rates. So Anonymous asks, will the employer match to the student loan payment be treated as income to the recipient, the employee? No. Anonymous asks, if there's $100,000 in a 529, is the student eligible for student aid? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. That's, that's, that's a very, <laughs> it's a very good question. It depends. So because a 529 plan can be owned by the parent or the grandparent or the aunt or uncle, uh, it can be owned by anyone. Um, it's not a, it's not considered the student's asset. So it's not counted as significant of a, um, of a asset on their financial aid FAFSA forms. Now, if it's a parent's five to nine, they are the account holder and it's for the benefit of the student. Typically there are some ways around that you kind of wait till year two, cause it's kind of a two year look back to count against the, the financial aid forms. So having it in the parent's name, but it's only counted a fractional percentage against their financial aid forms um, versus if it's in the child's name. So if you have a Roth IRA in the name of the child's name, which we'll get to, if you have a Roth IRA or any kind of UTMA, UGMA, or 
any account in the child's name that counts directly as a hundred percent of their assets against their financial aid forms. The 529, if it's in the parent's form uh, name, it counts minimally. Now, a great tool is to have it in the grandparents or relatives names. Mm. Yeah. So here's the deal is if it's in the grandparents name, it's not counted at all. Not until, not as long as you don't use it in year one. There's right. a couple nuances to that, but for the most part, it's much better to have it in the grandparents' name. Yeah. So this is not a situation where you're giving the kids, you know, if you're if you're the grandparent and your kids are, you know, if, if you have grandkids that are three or four or five, your kids are probably working hard, trying to make ends meet for many people. And if the grandparent gives the money to the child who then puts it in the 529, it might be better for the grandparent, right? to right. put the money in the 529 right. for the grand. I keep, I keep my 529s for my kids and my, and the grandparents' names. Hmm. Uh, Ernie asks, what is the process and what are the penalties to withdraw excess funds if you don't want to carry them over to future generations? Let's say you have more money than is needed. Mm -hmm. what, what happens? Yeah. So Jim, if you could go to, I think the next slide, um, Okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to address that question uh, okay. in, in a moment here. Um, go to the next one. We'll go back to this one. Okay. So a um, couple things. One, if you have excess funds in the 529, you can take them out. Uh, you would just pay capital gains, just like you would any uh, long-term capital gains rates, just like you would on any gain in a normal investment account. So you're, you're not going to have a penalty. You're just going to have taxable gain that you would pay otherwise if you had it in a normal investment account. The nice thing about a five to nine, and I actually sat down with a client just the other day and um, they've got both their kids went through MIT. Their, their, the grandparents funded it with five to nines early on. And it went so beyond what the need was to use the five to nines that that five to nine is going to actually create um, a general, it's a, it's going to be a family five to nine education legacy fund. It's gonna act kind of like a private foundation for their family because anything that was unused is gonna go, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars unused that'll go to the next generation. And there's no um, cap on what that can grow to. So this can actually go multiple different generations to wow. carry on tax-free for any college, you know, accredited school room board, all of that. So, you know, starting with the grandparents in this particular example, this just shows, you know, if you did a front loading of, um, of funding for grandchildren and that grew over that period of time to age 18 to 22, spend down the money for college, you know, you're still going to be left with funds left over. That'll grow to the next generation for the next, um, set of grandkids. And so this can go, truly multiple generations. Um, so we typically recommend if you don't need the money for your own retirement, rather than paying the taxes to have the sale, keep it for the next gen. Yeah, this is a really powerful tool. And I see this, the most you can put in, in a 529 is 475,000. Now you, you might burn an exemption on that, but um, that's the most you can put in, but this, these are, this is really powerful. Yeah. Uh, this is amazing. And because you can use the five-year front loading, you can do it without using your lifetime um, estate exemption. So you can front load your annual gifting exemption and be able to have quite a significant amount of money get out of your estate and carry on, like I said, with getting money out of the estate. So this is, this is a very great tool if you're looking to give the gift of education this is a great way to do it. Doesn't have trust annual trust tax returns. It doesn't have all the um, trust income limitations. So this is really a unique way to create kind of that family foundation for education. Yeah, Christine, I'm glad you mentioned that. That you know we are yes, estate trust and tax planning. But I will tell you, the human brain only has so much headspace for stuff. And I would say, to the extent you can simplify or minimize complexity in your estate plan. I'm a, a huge fan of that. Absolutely. This is a very, this is a very, I, I don't want to say simple tool, but it requires no headspace. It's an account that's on your, that's on your statement. You know, you're not, again, you're not having to deal with a whole lot of stuff. It's just this number that hopefully keeps getting bigger year after year. Anonymous asks, is there a limit like a gift amount on the amount the employer pays 
uh, on the student loan for professional students, I'm, I'm assuming students are professionals, is it, does this amount come out as income to the employee or, or the student? So I, I think- I think we already uh, addressed that. It, it's yeah, not income. You're not paying, so this, I, I just wanna address this. There, there might be some confusion. What we're talking about here is somebody who has graduated from school and they're no longer in school and they're working in a company. The company can, instead of matching the 401k, give a like amount, Christina, correct, a like amount that goes, uh, that is not taxable as income, that reduces the student loan debt. We are not talking about people who are in school and you're using a 401k match to pay tuition. I think that's that's something that's different and it's not not what we were talking right. about. Right. There may be like some some employers offer tuition reimbursement or um, you know, incentive. It's part of their incentive plans. Now there's some like, I know, for example, big four accounting firms sometimes will pay for a master's or, you know, have certain incentives. And if they, you know, forgive certain amounts of tuition, sometimes that is a taxable form, depending on how they're doing their employee incentives. When it comes to taking the option of the 401k match, it can't, the, the, it can't be discriminatory as an employer. So if you offer a 4% match or a 6% match or a 5% match, whatever that is for the 401k, some employees might put in 4% of their 401k and take that match to go into their 401k for the retirement plan. That, that employee can take that 4% and then the employer pays the payment directly or gives a check directly payable to the student loan. So it's not taxable as income. It's just in lieu of taking that retirement match. So it's not like they can pay 6% over here and 4% over there. It's just whatever they offer in the plan to all employees, they have the option of making that available to a student loan payment or a, a match in the 401k. So Anonymous asks, if, if the 529 is in the grandparent's name mm -hmm. and the grandparent passes away, what happens to the 529? That would be according to their trust terms as to who's the next successor owner of managing that five to nine. Oftentimes it's the kids, you know, if they're children, it goes in, in, and you're, by the way, your living trust, this is really important. Your living trust should have powers that permit the trustee to deal with a 529, because if it doesn't, you might have a problem. Right. So Lee asks, if I set up a trust for a grandchild and then transfer the stock in, into it before the sale to put it into a 529, can the taxes do be paid out of the trust? Lee, I would say on a high level, yes, um, that, that's correct. And that's something, uh, probably a one-on-one -on -one because if you do need to liquidate, um, I, I'm assuming a low basis stock where you would have a, a big capital gain, that's something that we should probably have a discussion about. You know, you and I and Christina get together and we can figure out the best way to mitigate the tax. But yes, you, this tax can be stuck on the assets of the trust. It could certainly be stuck on the beneficiary. It could be stuck on you. It's whatever you decide. Uh, and there is flexibility in planning on how that's paid. So really it's case specific. Exactly. Jim, do you mind going back for just a moment before sure. we jump into the next couple topics? Um, yep. So this was just one of the other um, myths was, you know, again, with this kind of go, we talked about this a little bit about the five to nine, but, you know, only 5.64% of parents' assets are used in financial aid calculations. So that's one of the other reasons why having a five to nine versus a directly owned asset that the student owns is, is better when it comes to financial aid calculations. Again, you know, this is the federal government. Look, the federal government on this one, they're teeing it up and making it really easy. If you get your A team together, and which is your financial advisors, we figure out a way to maximize the, the grants and, and maybe student aid, financial aid that you can get from government and non-governmental sources and the, and the assets that you have, again, to maximize uh, the benefit for the family. Yep. And the last myth that we talked about was the, the trust. You know, if you have a generation skipping trust or a dynasty trust, mm -hmm. not to say that those aren't great tools of mm -hmm. lowering an overall estate, they're great tools, but this is just a very good complementary tool that again, doesn't have the additional tax filings, taxes on, you know, higher tax rates for trust is for trust tax returns. So um, the visual of just showing how much a, a real gift could be is this next slide here, which just shows if you do the five-year, um, front load gifting. I think it's the next slide. Next slide. Yeah. This one, um, you know, the contribution is a completed gift. And so if you've got a fairly large estate, obviously not everyone's dealing with these large of estates, but as we are potentially looking at lower estate, um, mm -hmm. state tax exemptions and lifetime exemptions, 
this is just another visual of if you did five year front loading for multiple grandchildren, you can get a fairly significant amount out of an estate fairly quickly and use that gift exemption, you know, without using that gift exemption. So anonymous um, asks, sometimes we hear the total student loan amount was paid in full by the employer. In this case, the amount paid for the loan does not come in as income to the student, correct? I would think that's probably taxable as income. Yeah, it depends on the employee incentive program. So that's mostly going to be taxable as income. What what I was mentioning is is at, in lieu of a 401k match specifically. And that's so just going to be a different. smaller, right? That's going to be a smaller, you know, twice a month kind of right. payment, right? Right. Um, so the other things that we were going to talk about is um, a Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. So obviously to have a Roth IRA, you have to have earned income. So the student would have to have earned income, but oftentimes business owners will have their kids work during the summers and generate enough, you know, mm -hmm. stuffing envelopes and generate enough income to issue them a W-2, put them on the payroll. Um, and they can have their own Roth IRA and, um, money can come out of that Roth IRA without penalties without taxes, as long as it's been in there for five years, um, it can come out without any taxes or penalties for education. Um, so this is an additional option. It can be used in addition to, um, there's no state deduction. There's no income deduction. You do have limitations. Um, it does also count against financial aid because it's a, it's an asset of the student as a Roth IRA. So it is a vehicle. Absolutely. Um, it's just not as typically often used quite as much as a five to nine. Yeah. And you know, what do you think about put, cause some of our clients, Christina, and, and for those of you who are business owners, you can put your kids on and pay them a salary. And so they have earned income and actually have a Roth for them. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you can be put as I believe it's 6,000 for this year and it's going up, I believe next it's going year. up next year. Yeah. But that's something you can do year over year. And if you put 6,000 away a year for a kid from 18 to 25, and if you never put another dollar in there, that's a huge pot of money, uh, come retirement time. So that's, that's another, that is another way of benefiting the children. But again, these are all just, these are tools and we use them in combination. Um, and it's, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, I think there's these apps where you can look at what's in your refrigerator and put down all the stuff you have, and it comes up with a recipe for something that's really good. That's kind of what we do, right? We look at your individual situation and we use different tools to come to optimize the, the outcome. Right. One of the other um, often overlooked vehicles is life insurance. And this, I think, is one of the most underutilized tool that can be done in conjunction with a five to nine. It's not, it doesn't have to be an either, or it can be in addition to, um, and a life insurance policy, uh, can be, I know it kind of sounds morbid, but you can actually get a life insurance policy on your kids. And, and the reason why you would do that, um, is because the cost of carrying a death benefit or a life insurance policy on a healthy young child is not expensive. So we've done this, um, for one-year-olds and we get, we issue a life insurance policy and not for the purpose of carrying a high death benefit, but, um, there is a, there is a death benefit component to it, but it's really for a cash value accumulation. And we're not talking term policies. We're talking, um, types of policies that allow you to invest the cash that's not going towards the cost of carrying the death benefit, but cash that can accumulate and it can do so with various mutual funds, investments. It could be doing, dealing with indices. It could be the S and P 500. Um, and it can build cash in a manner that allows you to pull that cash out tax free as a loan from the policy. So if the policy has enough cash in it to cover the loan interest. So if the loan interest is 4% and the policy is earning 7%, the policy is paying for itself. You have to have tax deferral time. You, you know, you have to have time for those funds to be invested. So um, you, you definitely need a good six, really 10 years to have marination of the cash accumulation to be beneficial if you're using this for college planning. 
Um, but this, the nice thing is it can be used for non-educational use. So it doesn't have to be an accredited vocation institution, trade school, university. It can be used for first time down payment on a house. So let's say your kid does get a scholarship and they don't want to use all the five or they don't need all the five to nine. You can also take money cash free or tax free from um, the cash accumulation to cover those uses. And then what you can do is gift the policy at a later date to that child once they become of age. And um, so this is also an asset that could be owned by the parent or the grandparent, not an asset used for the cash value is not used for financial aid, but you can use that cash value tax-free. So this is a great vehicle um, with no income limitations, no funding limitations. Um, and it also has a tax-free death benefit should there ever be um, the need to use that. Mm. You know, something, Christine, you mentioned life insurance and life insurance for, you know, if you're watching this, life insurance predates income tax in the United States. Mm -hmm. Life insurance has a very special place in the Internal Revenue Code. It gets really favorable tax treatment. Mm -hmm. And for our wealthier clients, many of them do use, um, I would say, sophisticated life insurance um, mechanisms to minimize overall tax. And there's a lot of taxes that we pay. And it does, uh, it can minimize taxes. So we have a lot of questions that came up. Uh, Nate asks, what about paying children for domestic labor as an income source for their Roth IRA? Nate, the only kind of drawback to domestic labor is it may not be deductible uh, for the person who's paying it. So you're kind of generating an income tax liability. I'm not sure it, it papers out on that one. Lee asks, if I, front load for, if I front load a Roth for five years, can I continue the normal donation in the following years? I'm assuming the 15,000 or next year, 16,000. You could continue it, Lee, but something to understand is if you front load the gift, if you super fund that 529, you're, you're basically compressing five years of gifts into one. And so if you did make a gift, it would be a taxable gift. You could, if you wanted to continue to transfer uh, wealth to your loved ones, you could structure it as a note, right? That is later forgiven. Or you could just burn your exemption, your your death tax exemption. Right, you could, use your, yeah, you could use your get death tax exemption. And, and I'll tell you, if you're a very, you know, our clients who have a hundred million dollar estate, guess what? They're making taxable gifts, right? Because it's because it's dropping the value of their estate. So it is not uncommon for families to make taxable gifts. Okay. Uh, Anonymous asks: Is there a limit a donee can receive on the number of gifts, each with a maximum of fifteen thousand? Uh, no. So it's fifteen thousand per donor to a donee, but a donee could receive. There's no so there's no gift tax in the sense that. The gift tax would be paid by the donor, the person giving the money. The person receiving the money is a tax-free transfer. That being said, you know, depending on where you are in the world, sometimes there is a gift tax. And that was one of the things that was on the table for in the original Biden proposals to change it so that it was limited per donee. It is no longer on the table that that is limited per donee. So you could have one grandchild get funding from multiple different grandparents, aunts, uncles, and there's no limitation. Hmm. Um, anonymous says my son already set up a 529 plan for their daughter. Mm -hmm. I was planning on adding to it, but it sounds like I should start a new 529 plan where I am the owner. Is that correct? Do you need to designate specific names or beneficiaries in the 529? Well, anonymous, I would say, first of all, um, I'm, we're not going to make a recommendation because we don't know your situation. But Christina, if you want to comment, I, I think all things being equal, it is probably better for the grandparent to have their own 529 account. And the other thing, the other, correct. Yeah, we can't make a specific recommendation. In, in theory, most often that's going to be the case. Most often. The other thing that I would say, the caveat to that is if it's in your own name, so it, if it is in your um you're the grandparent and it's in your name, you have control over those funds. Whereas if you contribute to the funds that are in your children's name, and if they come on financial hard times or loss of job, those funds are theirs to use. So that would be the other thing is to make sure that it's in um, your name. If there's any concern of making sure you have control over the use of the funds. Steve asks, I've heard that it's a good idea for grandparents to pay college costs starting in the student's third year. Can you address this? Um, it, at least at the end of the second year, typically, because that really is applicable if you're dealing with financial aid or grant, you know, grants, 
are one thing, but if you're dealing with financial aid FAFSA forms, there's a two year look back on any money that was received by the student that came from a five to nine. So the end of year two, beginning of year three is typically the best situation if financial aid is something that the student is eligible for. Chris asks, when a 529 ownership changes from the grandparent to parent, is that a gift? I'm assuming that's by death. Um, is that a gift? I mean, is it includable in the gross estate? Um, depends. Depends. We'd have to look at that and just see, okay. um, was there a, a gift tax return filed? If was there front loading? Typically, okay. it's excluded from the estate um, so we'd have to just look at the specific. Depends on when there's a three-year rule. There's a whole bunch. Yeah, there's of a three-year look back on yeah. if it's includable in your estate or not. So there's, except for the five-year gifting annual exclusion. So there's some nuances to that. Well, if you guys have any other further questions, we've kind of, it looks like we've reached the end of our time together here on, uh, on giving the gift of education. And, uh, I, I do want to close by saying my grandfather who was born in 1909 started college in 1928 and then went to a year of college, and then went back in the fall of 1929. And then, of course, the stock market crashed, and then he left college and went back to the farm, and later worked in a factory in Detroit for General Motors, and was able to put his three sons through school on a factory worker's job, right? Factory worker's salary, his three sons, who all got advanced degrees, so in our family, I can just say, we really value education. If you spent this time watching this, you value education as well. And um, I, I would say, again, this is probably one of the highest value things that you can give to the people that you love is this gift of education, because too many people um, just simply don't have the money to go to school is, is, is a problem. And they just can't, they just can't do it. So great opportunity. Um, so we have a question, what are the three and five-year rules? Anonymous, the three-year rule, gifts made within three years come back into your estate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the old um, if axiom. You don't, if you don't outlive that three years. Correct. It's... So they look back. And then that five-year, is that's super funding the IRA. So if you put $15,000 per person, uh, you know, per donee per year, that's $75,000. 15,000 times five is $75,000. You can put $75,000 in a 529. But if you die in year four, some of those gifts are going to come back. So again, it, it, it really depends. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And thank you for, for watching us. Be sure and, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can go ahead and put something in the comments. And uh, if you do subscribe to our YouTube channel, then it, this will pop up in your feed. And we have tons of YouTube uh, videos on our website. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you.